And I found myself writing a story instead. It was the strangest thing. I don't usually have this happen, but as I reflected on the scripture and started to let what I always call my stream of consciousness go, for some reason I started to write my own story of the birth of Jesus, starting with this text that I shared with you this morning. I wish I could share the story with you today. I feel like uh, I need to develop some characters a little bit more and, and to work with the story and let it work with me. I hope that maybe next year I'll be able to, to share with you with this story. Maybe it'll come out in writing or maybe I'll just read it to you in some way uh, during the Advent season. But what I found about the, this exercise, and I had to put the brakes on because I, I really felt that it wasn't going to be ready for this morning. But what I found out that the simple act of writing this short story was refreshing my memory. Refreshing my memory of the story of the birth of Jesus. It's not like I, I really need to be reminded of the story, but yes, I do need to have my memory refreshed by God's story for me and for the world. And what the refreshing of the story does, and what it does is it renews my understanding of what God really wants me to know and wants you to know. And what God wants me and you to believe. When we hear the story of the birth of Jesus, because I believe when we refresh our memory, we find out that there truly is a message for each one of us. And it may be a very different message because of the different places that we find our lives. There is a message for every listener and every reader unique to their place in the world. Matthew and Luke are the only two Gospels that begin, they don't even begin, that have the birth story. John goes back to the Hebrew Bible, begins with a parallel story to Genesis, the creation story. And, and Mark begins with Jesus later in life and the story of John the Baptist. But Matthew and Luke, when we combine the two gospel stories of the birth of Jesus, we get that, that holistic story that many of us know. We put all the characters into one place. But when you go back this week and read those two stories in Matthew and Luke, you'll, you'll see they're a little bit different. But there is the beginning of the story. Both of these stories, remember, were written probably at least for Mark, 60 years after the birth of Jesus, and for Matthew, 70, 80 years, and for Luke, about the same. These are stories that were generations after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so these are stories that begin, inspired by God, that begin with memory. The memory of faithful followers of Jesus. Those early disciples of the church who stood their ground in the face of incredible opposition even loss of life. But they dared to draw upon their memory that story that was told to them. And the story that they were fashioning so that it would be a story for the world as they knew it at that time. A story of God's love and grace for the world. A story that would not only transform their lives as they put pen to scroll, but would transform those who would hear, listen to it, bring it deep within their hearts. And so, it was memories. Memories that they drew forward, just like for us today. We gather here on the Sunday before Christmas, a time of the year that is just so pregnant with memories. Memories that we give birth to as we join with friends and family. Memories that, yes, are a mixed blessing. Memories that, that we hold deep within our heart, that, that bring smiles and warmth to us and memories that are painful and sorrowful, that bring tears to our eyes. But this is a season filled with memories, memories that are tied to a story about God's love for the world. And so I prayerfully 
acknowledge that all of you gathered here this morning are in that time of the year where Christmas brings forth the memories of years gone by. Whether it's childhood, youth, or young adult, or mature adult, it's a time where we remember relationships and experiences. It's a time where we blend in the season of hope, joy, peace, and love into the reality that we have and share as humans. We do this in the face of a culture, a culture that speaks to the consumption side and joyful side and party side and all that is so much fun in the season. And we do this as Christians in a way trying to strike that balance where we enter into the story of the birth of Jesus at the same time living in a world that sometimes distorts it. And so when we turn to the story of the birth of Jesus, yes, we bring our own story, don't we? We bring the memories, the culture, all that comes with it as who we are as people. And so the question for us every year, and this time of year, is what does God really want us to know and believe when we hear this story once again? It's the same question we ought to be asking ourselves when we read any gospel story, especially this gospel story. Another question that you may want to ask yourself as you listen to this story and as you remember your story and you bring your story into it, where does your story as a Christian, as a person, intersect with the story that God is telling us through the birth of Jesus Christ? Maybe you may find yourself asking this question as well. Where do you meet God? Where do you meet God in the story of the birth of Jesus? And so my humble suggestion to you this week is, is to go about reading these two stories, Matthew and Luke, and then try writing your own Jesus birth story. The same thing that happened to me. See what happens when you put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard or voice to recorder. Try writing your own birth story. Bring in your own memories. Bring in your own understanding of the world today. See what God has to say to you. Because remember, this story is not a once-in-a-lifetime story, but a living story. A story inspired by God for God's people to be inspiring. Not to be told once and recorded, but to be retold and relived. So try it out. Let the characters talk to you. What would the shepherds say to you? Would they even be shepherds? Maybe they would be other characters that you meet in your daily life. They'll be the unexpected first-time listeners of God's voice and announcement of the birth of Jesus. Who would Mary and Joseph be? Try it out and see what happens. But this morning, the story we read is the story that we have heard from the very beginning we could remember or listen to. It's a story that begins in a particular time in history. It's a time when Palestine was under the imperial power of Rome. The Jewish people were subject to countless laws and rules in support of the power and will of this oppressive government. And so the story is told that all the people would have to go to their homeland or hometown or whatever uh, place where they were born and to register. And the purpose of the registration back in those times was purely for taxation purposes. It was the April 15th or 13th, whatever that day is, we pay our taxes. Everybody needed to show up, register, so that they could be faithful taxpayers. Joseph, Mary, very young taxpayers. Mary, about ready to deliver a child, had to travel to Bethlehem, David's birthplace. Excuse me, David's birthplace and Joseph's birthplace. Biblical historians cannot really find support for this whole idea that there was the census. Yes, there were censuses back in the time, but the, the biblical scholars say they really can't draw a line to this particular census that we're told about. But needless to say, 
It's part of our story. Needless to say, the first story begins when a young couple are on the move to the city of Bethlehem. And upon arrival, Mary and Joseph search for a place to stay, expecting the birth of their son at any time. But meanwhile, the scene switches to a hillside not too far from Bethlehem. And there is a whole other lifestyle, shepherds. Their life is on the rocky and sandy hillsides, the patches of pasture where they could move from place to place, taking care of the earth while taking care of their sheep. And I must add, I don't believe that they owned the sheep. They were taking care of the sheep of the landowners and the farmers that lived down in the valley. These were men who were sent with their sons to live on the hillsides to take care of the sheep just as if they were their own. They lived in very rustic and difficult circumstances. They slept outside. They didn't have a regular source of water unless it was the place where the sheep could drink. They ate what they could. They had a very, very difficult life. They couldn't keep clean like everybody else. They brought on a certain odor, they started even to smell like the sheep because they were sleeping with them close by to guard them. When they went back into the villages and towns to, to bring the sheep to the owners, their neighbors didn't want to get close to them. They were unclean, smelly, long beards, kind of greasy hair, dirty hands, grimy nails, you know, the whole thing. But there they were on the hillside. There was a moment totally unexpected to them. It was a moment where God came to them with a message. It was a moment that they never ever dreamt of that would involve them in the story. Oh, sure, they had heard distant reminders from others who knew the stories of the prophets like Isaiah who pointed to the future that there may be born this Messiah, this child who would come into the world and save the people of Israel. They had some slight understanding but they never ever thought that God would come to them in all their grime and weariness and break into their life with this news. We might not think of this as much for ourselves, but for them it was life-changing, amazing. What about our story? When has God broken into your life? When has the grace of Jesus Christ broken into your life and revealed to you in all your griminess and smelliness and brokenness the depth of God's love for you? The shepherds were terrified by the voice and the presence of God. And imagine being on those hillsides with them. Imagine yourself sitting there by the fire. And all of a sudden, God appears in the voice of this angel. And all of God's glory, all lighting up that whole hillside. And God appears with a message of salvation for the world. It's just not a personal interaction with you, the shepherd, or any of the shepherds that are gathered on the hillside. It's a message for the world, and they were receiving it. What would we do different than the shepherds if we were there in that story? And so what did the shepherds do? What can we learn from them? What can we learn from their story, and what can we introduce into our story? Well, the first thing that the shepherds did, they stayed in the presence of God. They could have got up and ran as fast as they can. You ever see a shepherd run fast? They're fast. <laughs> Even with those sandals on, they can go. Because they had to learn how to run fast to chase those wolves and to catch those sheep that were taken off on their own. They're fast. The shepherds stayed in the presence of God in all the glory, as scared as they were. They stayed in the presence of God. And brothers and sisters, sometimes in our own fear, in our own struggles, in our own sorrow, we want to run too. But sometimes we just have to sit there and stay in the presence of God. 
So we can learn that from the shepherds in our story. When we need to also be obedient and stay in the presence of God, even in the depths of our fears. And after learning of the good news, this is when the angels reveal to the shepherds and all that glory what's going to happen. What do they do? They share their experience. They share their experience. They speak to one another. You know, for us up here in New England, and I speak for us, the Anglo community, sometimes we keep our faith a little private. It's like, I don't know. I've grown up in this part of the world, and um, when I've traveled to other places in the world, I've always found it quite amazing and sometimes even uncomfortable for all to come over in, in Ghana. You know, the willingness to talk about faith is much more on the surface of the existence of the beings. In other words, it's everywhere. These shepherds teach us the importance of being willing to talk about our faith. And you can't say, none of us can say, we never have an opportunity to talk about our faith. I haven't talked about my faith, but nobody ever Well, wait a minute. If you're alive and breathing, you have a chance to talk about your faith. Because anywhere you go, any people you meet, are struggling with the realities of being human, and faith is a matter of human experience. And so, if you're breathing and walking, and you meet a stranger, you don't have to go into a preaching mode or anything, but you can do something that will impress upon that person that you are a believer. It may be a simple gesture of kindness. It may be an offer to pray for that person. It may be a simple sacrifice of saying, I, I, I know I can do something here for you, and I, I'm going to do this, and I'm doing it not because of who I am, but because of this peasant child who was born long ago, and there we go. The story unfolds. The shepherds stayed in the presence of God, and they were willing to stay there and then share with one another their experience. Again, what else can we learn? After sharing their experience, the shepherds made a collective decision to experience what God has done. What's that a collective experience? They decided to get up and to move and go down to Bethlehem. Now they could have stayed on that hillside. If they didn't run, they could have stayed there in the presence of God. Remember Peter? What did he want to do in the, the transfiguration of Jesus? Well, we're going to stay here in a village of three condos. There's going to be one for you, Elijah, one for you, Christ, and we're going to stay here where it's going to be a great... Jesus said, no, 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 you've got it all wrong, we're going back down. And the shepherds could have stayed there too. They could have built a beautiful altar place, a nice... This is where God revealed to us the great story of the birth of Jesus. We shared it, we thought it would be a great idea to build this beautiful stone altar. But no, they made a decision that they were going to be on the move. They wanted to see, they wanted to experience, they wanted to be part of the story in a way that allowed them to worship and to be present and to touch if they were allowed to and to be with the Christ child. And so our story too is what do we do to move towards Bethlehem? What do we do to move towards the Christ child? What do we do to take action, to be decisive about our faith, not only to share it, but to act upon it in a way that not only draws ourselves closer to Christ, but may draw others close to Christ. You see, what they simply wanted to do, these shepherds, is they wanted to get off that hillside and get in on what God was doing down there in Bethlehem, so they picked up I don't know who took care of the sheep. Maybe the sheep went with them. They're all going down the hillside, going into Bethlehem, searching for Mary and Joseph and the newborn child, Jesus, and they find him. And remember, they simply do not go because they're curious. They're not spectators. They're not pedestrians. They are actors. They are moving on their faith. They had heard from God, being in presence of God, made a decision for themselves, and through the grace of God are moving on to a closer unity with the Christ child by being there with him. But they were not going 
to leave that message on the hillside. They could have done that. They could have left that message on the hillside. But they're going to bring that message home. They share with Mary a message that she holds deep in her heart. Even though Mary, if you read the other, the gospel stories of the birth of Jesus, had, had some idea what she, that she was going to be this vessel of new life, the handmaiden of the Lord, but she takes it in deep within her heart from these, these strangers, these unexpected messengers of the gospel, the word of God, she takes it in and she puts it deep within her heart. And here is the task of the shepherds. They're bringing it home. They're making that connection with Christ and Mary. And they themselves complete that unity and enable them to go back into the world. And they do that jumping up and down and celebrating. The sheep are going left and right every which way. The shepherds are just praising God. They're, they're, you know, they're, I got their, their, whatever they call it there, their long staff, they're waving them in the air. They were just so excited that they experienced God's story and it had become their own. They were there for it all. Imagine yourself being there. What would we do? We put that big foam number one on our hands, right? I know Jesus, I saw him. And we would jump up and down. We'd have the big, long horns, and we would celebrate because we found ourselves in the story. We are there too. The story that they had imagined from long ago through the words of the prophets became real to them as they were brought into the story and moved to become messengers of the story. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the story of Jesus' birth is a story to be read over and over and over again. And it's a story I beg you not to accept as an annual tradition, but it's a way to refresh our memories, to refresh our memories of God's presence and God's call to discern and to discuss what God is doing in the world and then to act upon it. It's a call for us to live out this story, to make it real in the world every single day. The message of God's love for the world is simply a call to action. It's a saving call to action. It's an invitation to take deep within our hearts the understanding and faith that God is always creating and recreating. God is always creating and recreating. That's why the story of the birth of Jesus is ever alive, always birthing new hope, love, justice in the world. And it stems from that promise that God made long ago that is revealed to us through Scripture that God will never leave us alone in the muck and the mire and the grime of our own lives, but find a way to lift us up and move us forward in unity through grace to be sanctified beings. This is what we learn. We go deep into the story and we take spiritual ownership of the gospel. If it's somebody else's story read to us because it was written long ago and that's why we read it because it was written long ago and we're told that we need to read it. If we don't take spiritual ownership of these words and bring them deep within our hearts and to chew on them as the psalmist says to get the sweetness of honey out of them, then they'll just be stories. But they're not. It's the word of God for the people of God. These stories were not written just for one group of believers, but inspired by God to breathe into humanity the truth of God's forgiving love for all of creation. And that's not a one-time message. It's an ongoing message until God completes God's project of salvation. And so when we listen to these stories, and when we listen specifically to the shepherd story, we ought to hear our own story. As I ask the children, who would they be? Who are you in the story? I say to you today, and to myself, that we can be those smelly outsiders of the world, the shepherds. We can be and we are those who are visited by God with the amazing good news of God's love. 
God's love becoming human. A love that looks like you and me. That's the story. And as long as we're walking and breathing and moving on this earth, this is the story that we're called to live out. And if this love looks like you and me, then we can live this message. Can't we? We can live this message of the birth of the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We can live this message in our own way. As we understand our story, the message of Jesus' birth is not for a chosen few, but for the world. And the best way for any of us to experience this message is to be willing to stay in the presence of the message of God and to see what we can do to live it out in the world. This means we are to be a people living as those who always live alongside God. And wherever we go, we can always understand and believe that in the birth story, God goes along with us, trying to, to get us and nudge us along into the rebirthing of this story to being that new sign of God's love in the world. Wow. Never thought writing a story would get me this far. I can't wait to, to finish this story. I, I really want to develop the characters. I want to see what God has to say to them and what God has to say to me through these characters. And the essence of the story is going to be no different than the story you just heard. The purity of the story, the essence of the story, the beauty of the story, the rough edges of the story is going to be no different than the story that's in your heart, in my heart, and in the gospel. It's the powerful story of God's love for the world. And it's only up to us to decide whether we're going to go into that story and live it out. To become those living characters. To take on the story and have that spiritual ownership. Being willing to go deeper into the story. The first story that for us is not one to just pick up on this day and on Christmas Eve, but it's a story for every day. And it's not a message to leave behind until the next Advent season, but a story to push forward and to follow and to walk into. It's a message to live not only for my sake, but for the sake of others. Friends, if we want to celebrate the birth of Jesus, I tell you, and I believe, and I pray that you will come to believe with me into the greater understanding that we need to enter into that story and make it our own. May you find a new way into God's story of love for you and for the world this Christmas season. Amen. Amen. Amen.